Hi friends, this is Dr. Ashish Taneja. We are back with the Knee Basics series and uh, this is part 2. Uh, today we will discuss fractures around the knee. So, as you know, the main fractures around the knee could be distal femur fractures or proximal tibia fractures. So, we will discuss both of them one by one. Some anatomy to begin with. Distal femur extends. Uh, what is distal femur precisely? It is the distal third of the femur which is around the length of the epicondylar axis. So if this is the axis uh, that we draw. If we draw the same line perpendicularly, so this region from here will constitute the distal femur fracture. Any fracture in this area will be a distal femur fracture. Approximately, this is around 10 to 15 centimeters in length. And the supracondylar region, it flares medially. If you see this, there is a medial flare which is more than the lateral flare in the coronal plane. And posteriorly, it is broader on a lateral side as compared to medial side. So this is something you would like to know. Also, there is a trochlea for the patella articulation. And the notch is more posterior as compared to, uh, if you see the 360 degree dimension, the intercondylar notch is more posterior and it houses the ACL and PCL. If you see a cut section, this is the axial cut section of a distal femur. It is trapezoidal in shape with the greatest dimension being posterior. So this is the posterior which is the greatest dimension and narrowest dimension is medial in the anteroposterior plane. This is the smallest dimension of distal femur. The medial side slopes about 25 degrees from the perpendicular. It slopes from posterior medial to anterolateral direction like this. This angle is 25 degrees and the lateral side is about 10 to 15 degrees inclined from the perpendicular. As we know uh, on the AP radiograph, there is a 6 degree valgus angle of distal femur plus the joint line is also in a bit of varus of 3 degrees. So this is what you should know about distal femur anatomy. On the lateral side, we have already discussed about these fine uh, radiographic landmarks. This line A represents the trochlear groove. This line B, which is the Blumen's art line, represents the notch. So, this is important. Line B here, which is a sclerotic line like this, it rep represents the notch and this represents the trochlea and they meet distally. This is very important when we talk about the surgical management. And in the true radiograph, both the condyles should overlap. So both these lines should be seen as one. In, as we know, the medial side is slightly bigger. So this is how we see it. The medial side will be slightly more distal as compared to lateral side, which is a dotted line. And in terms of uh, the tibia, the medial tibial plateau is concave which is seen here. This concave shadow will be the medial tibial plateau and the lateral tibial plateau is convex so as it's seen here, dotted line. So this is what you should remember. So if you see this x-ray, this is a true x-ray with good uh, overlapping of condyles. We are seeing all the lines and we are seeing both the medial concave tibial plateau and the lateral convex 
the bill plateau. In terms of supracondylar fracture, it has a bimodal distribution. It can happen in young adults in a high velocity injury, in an RTA. So bimodal means two main age groups. One is young adults and one is elderly. Elderly patients will usually have a low energy fall, like ground level fall or a twisting injury that can lead to a supracondylar fracture. It is very important in adults, uh, especially because it can have a big influence on their mortality post-op. Uh, there are studies which say that these fractures can have as much as 18% mortality at one year. So this is a big number. So you have to manage these fractures uh, very uh, meticulously. So mostly, as I said, there are low energy injuries which can result from ground level falls or they can be torsional injuries in osteopenic or osteoporotic bone. We also see these fracture in cases of arthroplasty as periprosthetic fractures because the junction of the implant and the bone is a high uh, stress area and can be a area uh, where the fracture happens. So mostly because of osteopenia and stress shielding, uh, such patients can have uh, periphysetic fractures with minor stress. Mainly it can happen in uh, distal to the hip, uh, it can happen just to the hip stem, it can happen to proximal to a knee prosthesis or uh, it can happen uh, even proximal to a nail, uh, if we have put a nail as well. All these will be classified as periprosthetic How do you classify these fractures? Classify as type A, B and C as per AO classification. Type A is a metaphysical fracture. So, there is no intercondylar involvement as you see here. And it is mainly a extra articular fracture. So type A is metaphysial extra articular fracture. A1 is simple. A2 has a metaphysial wedge. And A3 will have combination. So this is a general principle for all classifications. A1 to A3 will be from simple to complex. Type B is a partial articular and it is divided into B1, 2, 3, which means uh, only one condyle is involved. So in B1, lateral condyle is involved in a sagittal plane. In B2, medial condyle is involved in sagittal plane. And B3 is a Hofas fracture, which is the posterior condyle involvement in the coronal plane. This is B1, B2 and B3. In type C, it is a complete articular fracture, which means both the condyles are involved. It can be again simple uh, C1, which is both articular area and metaphysical area are simple, straightforward fractures. In C2, it is the articular fracture is simple, simple two part, uh, two fracture lines going like this. But there is combination in the metaphysial area. So this is C2. And in C3, both the metaphysial and articular combination is present. So this is how we classify the supracondylar fractures. What is the treatment principle? Treatment principle is simple. If it's an extra articular fracture like type A, we don't have to worry about the joint line.